So we're going to have two to talk about the evolving role of managers. Um, I'm delighted to be joined again by Jeff Jampel, who talked earlier on. He manages the Doors and the Ramones and other amazing legacy artists. Uh, and we're also going to have Jonathan Dickens, um, founder of September Management, whose clients include Adele, London Grammar, Jamie T, Paul Epworth, and Rick Rubin. And I could happily listen to 10 minutes of anecdotes about Rick Rubin, who's another amazing artist. But they're going to talk about the role of managers and how it's changing, and with less feedback than me. So I'd like to welcome both to the stage. I'm talking to you guys, yeah. Oh, but you're going to have to sit down, right? Yeah, yeah. You more yeah sorry, that way, right? I'll switch sides this time. So we'll you guys both have head, you guys have ear mics on, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, man. Anywhere in particular? I'll Where sit on the like edge. Let's, let's, let's spread out. Let's make ourselves comfortable. All right. Thank you both for being here. I'm going to continue my, uh, my moderation. Uh, and you know, it's a really this is a really fascinating subject for me because, you know, as a publication, we don't deal a lot with management. Uh, and at the same time, with the festival, we see kind of we get more insights into the the operation of what it means to be a band at this point or an artist. And at the same time, it's very new territory for me. You know, I I uh, I instructed a course at a university in Chicago where I'm from, and it was about kind of the music, the business of music, so to speak, and how. You know, they're mostly musicians, it's an art school, but the point being is how important having a team around you is and how important understanding the financials of things are. And really what I want to come away with, and I hope that I, I could probably speak for everyone, is just getting an understanding of how important not only what you do is, but how you've seen it evolve over the years. And, and, uh, and I guess specifically where we should start is with who you work with and, and, and how, how you got into what you're doing now. Okay, you really probably want to hear from this guy because he's one of the best managers on the planet. Certainly one of the greatest artists on the planet. But Paola still exists. So What's that? That was a bribe. Yeah. <laughs> true, it's management. Yeah, true. But it's managing, <laughs> managing artists regardless of what they're doing. You know, is, uh, I, I, again, it's a it's new world for me. So. Yeah, so I work with... I had a label to start with, actually. I had a label, a kind of small electronic label where I put out um, kind of weird and interesting, well, I think so anyway, weird and interesting electronic music. I put out MIA, I put out uh, Punjabi MC, and some interesting stuff. And then I got into management uh, back in about 2006. Um, actually, no, 2000, 2006 when I started my own company, and I started it with uh, a guy called Tom Vec, Jamie T, Adele, and Jack Pignati. And at that stage, they were all very much out of the scene. Um, Managed them all from the beginning, and then since then the company's grown, and we've taken on London Grammar. We've taken on some producers as well, which is an area that I wasn't really concentrating on, but fell into. So we took on Paul Wetworth, that uh, has produced France and the Machine, has just done the Hunger Games track with Lord, mm -hmm. has done Dell, and obviously I work with Rick as well, and everyone knows what Rick's discography right. is. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's how that's who I look after. And, that's, and uh, I come from a family all in music, so it was kind of easy for me. It became like not doing the same thing as I do, but it was a family. You know, my father's a booking agent. My uncle was a chairman of a, of a major record company, and my sister is also a booking agent. So it was kind of in my own sphere, in the, exactly in a family business. So how about you? What, what it, 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 obviously understanding that not fully kind of it's not the same context, but what. How did you get into, and I know most, I, I'm sure that you're gonna, some of this might feel redundant con considering that you've spoken already, but a uh, quick briefing would be nice. Well, we, again, we have a very specialized company and we deal with iconic artist legacies. So uh, worldwide I manage, <coughs> pardon me, I manage The Doors, I manage the Jim Morrison estate separately, Janis Joplin, Otis Redding, uh, Tupac Shakur, The Ramones, um, Peter Tosh, uh, we consult Peter, and we consult the Michael Jackson estate. Very cool. Um, so I guess the first, beyond, you know, obviously your biographies, which I appreciate you sharing, what, uh, what are some of the essential, I guess, you know, what are some of the essential roles of the, ma the manager plays, and how does that differ from other aspects of a band's oper or an artist's operation? I mean, what... Well, there, there's a global question, which let's address, and then I actually have a couple questions for Jonathan. Very good. He's right in the heart of it. Here's the thing, and feel free to interrupt when I fuck it up. Um, the entire focus has turned upside down, okay? The way our business formed, really, in the 50s is the record label was at the center, okay? And uh, 
And here's the way that the, uh, uh, an in income pie should look for a successful ar ar current artist. Uh, 60 to 65 percent of their income is going to come from tickets, 15 to 25 percent from tour merch, 10 to 15 percent from publishing, 2 to 5 percent uh, from ancillary, and 2 to 4 percent from record sales. That's about the pie. Is that about? It depends artist to artist, but that would probably yeah. be right as a generalization. Yeah. Okay. So, actually, I'll tell you, I'll I'll paraphrase what a great manager said in our UCLA class because he got up in front of about 220 students, and this is the way he explained it. He said, I'm a manager, my artist has a legacy and a brand, and I oversee that worldwide. He said, and my brand throws off six different revenue streams, which are the ones I just mentioned. He said, and so as the manager who guides it, I license my ticket income to promoters, I license my tour merch income to merch companies, I license my publishing income to an administrator or a publisher, and right on down the line. He said, and then we get to the record label. And what he said was, uh, the record label is really a, uh, hey, 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 look who's here. This guy knows more than anything about what I'm talking about. Uh, what he said, his words were, the record label is a butt fuck licensee of two to four percent of my artist's revenue, and any artist that lets a two to four percent licensee guide his career is a jerk, asshole, and loser and deserves what he gets. But what used to happen is, re and record labels are our partners and they're our friends, and I, lo I love the labels we work with, but it used to be there was so much money in records that the record company could help build a career and put in marketing funds uh, ad nauseum to help break an artist, okay? And I think a lot of people had it backward because people used to think that the Rolling Stones were going out to, on tour to support this record, or this band's going out because they got a new record, they're gonna support the record. They had it ass backwards. It's exactly the other way around. The band put out the record to support the tour because the tour is the major income producer. The artist owns 100% of that. Um, and well, not, not necessarily because... The, a, a bigger percentage than they do yeah. of the record. Well, it depends on, you know, obviously the, where, where obviously record sales declined, major labels, primarily more independents of getting into the world of ancillary rights. So Correct. if they're tour supporting st tours from the start, they're invariably taking a percentage, which is negotiable. That can be in perpetuity beyond the contract. Yeah. It can be until recruitment. So there's, there's, it, they're trying they're, to get they're, involved. They're looking at a way back. But yeah. I think, I think the, the, the fundamentals of management haven't changed. And I think business is about keeping things simple. Fundamentals of management are great artists making great music fundamentals. Then I think it's about the protection of those artists against all of these income streams and making sure that the artist is positioned in the right way. I think the modern business and what's changing so much in my generation and people in, you know, I'm 42, but the generation of me and below is how the business is shifting because the, the business, the business was always about buying stuff. So when it was cassettes and, and CD, it was about when it, was, when it was cassettes and vinyl, it became about buying CD. Then you had the kind of disasters, that was, which were DCC and Minidisc. <laughs> then, it became the I, then it became the iTunes store. But they're all about buying stuff. We're going now, and it's going to happen within five years. It will be ubiquitous in five years. We are going now into a streaming model. Right. Where the people want to be in it, they don't want to be in it. Within five years, I think it will be everywhere. And that suddenly does not become about buying anymore. It becomes about consumption and it becomes about access. So that's fundamentally where the modern music business has changed. And that hasn't been done before. Because whether you were, you know, if you, if you were managing the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, whether it was consumption of music, you know, books and sheets, or it was a consumption of 78s or 45s or LPs or CDs, it was all about buying. And that's primarily where I see the recording model changing. But the interesting thing, though, maybe for both of you in the ways that you're managing artists, but you guys are probably the anomalies in the sense that I mean, you know, whether it be Adele or some of the legacy acts, and they're still selling like that type of transaction, even though it's shifting away. But the line share is working. So, as a, from the managerial side of it, how do you? I mean, are you reprioritizing? Or are you still? Because you've had, you guys have been, I would argue, the anomaly, not the yeah. norm, right? So, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is that Adele is an exception, not the rule. She's right. an exception to the music industry. She's, de she's definitely an exception to my roster. <laughs> you know, I'm, on, on one hand, I've got Adele that the record is 
you know, and what's phenomenal and about that, and, it, and it's really just how stars have aligned in many ways, is that the record is at currently 21, that the, the album came out in 2011. We've sold 30 million copies of that album in 2011. Wow. Now, is that all? That, yeah, exactly. Um, then I've got artists like King Crawl. They're actually the only artist that I represent that Pitchfork's semi-nice about. Uh, That's true. Love <laughs> grammar, we like. Um, we like it, well, Dale. you know. Oh, yeah, you do, actually, yeah. Love grammar, Dale. Who else? King Crawl. Yeah, Jamie T. I don't know if you know no, that guy. a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. We'll talk later. We're plugging. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually here just to plug my just music. Just to punch me in the face. It's fine. Um, so no, but what, what she, I is the, she, is the, she is the anomaly. So she's the exception. Of all. And yeah, absolutely. You know, we, you know Adele quite famously, we haven't toured that much for, for many different reasons. And she's, she's one, of, and I absolutely agree with Jeff that I think touring has become a major focus point of pretty much 99.9% .9 of current touring oh. art, artists' careers and, and things. Except and for mine. The, the things that come out, right. the merch that comes no. off that. Exactly. You can, you can do holograms. You do the holograms. That is, holograms are a thing now. Yeah. Everything could be virtual. I have an opinion Oculus on that. Rift. <clears throat> but the, the key being, the, the, where I was getting to, is that Jonathan is in the Adele business. Okay? I am in the Doors business. Neither one of us is really in the record business. Right? We have these legacies that we look after, and we have to be experts at publishing, and at apparel, and touring, and records, and in your case, radio, and in my case, Broadway, and theater, and books, and museum exhibits, and, 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 and co-branding, and sponsorship, and we guide these legacies. And so the record business is a key but small part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so each of those, if you think about it, a book publisher knows nothing about the record business, who knows nothing about the apparel business, who knows nothing about museums, who knows nothing about publishing, right? We're the guy in the middle, we're the quarterback, the artist is the CEO. We have to communicate the vision and the legacy and across all these different platforms, right? And like I said, it used to be that the labels were really the guides. They were the ones that had the money and the influence. I mean, record labels are really, really good at communicating with and marketing to pop culture. They may do it poorly or greatly on different occasions, but they have the machine and the methods to do that, right? But we have all these different platforms, yeah. so we have to get all these players to work together. You know, a quick example, we're working on something now, which you'll see, um, we're working with the Smithsonian and several other museums, and we're going to erect mini exhibits on these artists inside, whether it be Zara or Bloomingdale's, with a special line of apparel, and then those museum exhibits are all going to come together in one huge exhibit, which will tour the world. And that's like a five to seven year plan. Mm -hmm. What does that have to do with records? Right, so I mean, I guess... Component for you, sir, are you starting with your, since your artists aren't legacy, obviously currently active, are you, do you view it the similar way where you, you're protecting legacy as much as you're protecting it now? I'm, I'm firstly starting with the music. Right. You know, it's slightly different because I'm starting with the music and I think that music, starting with getting the music as good as it can possibly be. And I'm still, I, I, you know, I'm still a believer in record labels. I'm not one of these people that, I, I don't like an us and them mentality. I don't think it works, between, and I think that's a very old school approach in terms of, you know, the Peter Grant school of things, where it was like going in there, banging a desk and, 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 and threatening people. Yeah, I, think that works I, 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 view the, I view the label, and it depends on what level you're talking about. You know, on a startup artist, to me, the, the, the core team, and of which the label, whether that be an independent or a major, or you self-release, which, again, we can get into what's happened now in terms of all doors are down, whether you're f and how you want to launch a record now. In before you were, you were fucked if you didn't have a major label. Now, there, there are many different streams. But anyway, the label, I think, is a very, very core part of what I do. Absolutely agree that once we get beyond, beyond a broken artist and the, st and the knowledge you have to know in different spheres, and as Jeff has actually mentioned, is absolutely correct. I think the other thing that comes in as well as knowing about these skills is actually what I call is, is, is called a, a content protector. Because I feel that the one thing that the internet has done is content is everywhere. Everyone is so hungry for content. And I think what's happened as a part of the hunger for content is we've reached saturation point. And I think that when you reach saturation point, it cheapens it. Yep. So the, one of the biggest things that I do is actually say no. And the power of saying no. And I think that's very, very... And, and, very that, could well be, and that can be no in any situation. That can be, I don't want to do an Adele perfume. <laughs> you know, we're not doing a nail polish. Or it can be you know, that ticket price is too high, or it can be you're not doing a deluxe album and putting it out at £4.99 and we're not going to release nine songs. Whatever it is, the power of saying no, having a, a knowledge of 
all the different spheres that Jeff has talked about and the power of being able to say no and fight for your rights and be the gatekeeper to these opportunities is key. So do you see, I mean, obviously you work with your artists for that reason, but do you see that as amongst a trend amongst other managers in, in that sphere? Or, because I mean, from our, my perspective, you see bands making wrong decisions all, all over the place. And, you know, is, is that a priority of artists or is that a rarity at I this point? I good think art, good artists, are like, like good people are good people. Sure, and, and, and not everyone's good. There's, there's crappy artists, there's crappy managers. There's, crap, there's good and crappy everybody. So I can't, I can't, def I look at people, what I find incredible is when you see artists that are successful, the ability to want to over-promote. Right. It stuns me. Yeah. It, and the, the thing is with record labels now, especially the majors, they live in a, what I call a culture of fear. So the days of when we used to romanticize about, you know, the start of Warner Brothers under Mo Austin or Geffen under David Geffen, when they were really run like Chris Blackwell under Ireland, or, you know, Ireland and Chris Blackwell, they were really run like independents, and they were, they were independent labels. Now what happens is, is that, that, and I don't blame the people within the companies, people live with these two, three, you know, three-year deals or whatever they've got. You know, they've got kids at school, this, that, and the other, and they have to produce hits. And if they get a hit, and let's be honest, hits are few and far between, especially meaningful ones, there's the ability to kill, to, to just, you know, look, look for blood and just rinse every last sale out of a record. Um, and I think it's dangerous. So I think the other thing as well that I think a manager has to do is have a view to protecting the long term. Because if you go Amen. into an artist and you sit there and it's just a short term approach, you're going to get short term results. Right. Amen. And that's part of the disconnect because we're working with uh, partners again who are our friends and who are partners, but we have to keep the long term vision intact and we have to protect that because that's not their job. Right? And the label is all about getting their P&L, their profit and loss for Q3, for the third quarter. That's Four, what it's about. Four. Right. <laughs> um, you know, we're about, uh, and you're about long-term success and vision, right? I mean, for us, is that we're in a little different business, but we plan in decades. I don't care about quarters. I try for long-term. You know, I, I just want to work with artists. It's different. You know, I have a small, my, my label is very, uh, label, my, my, but it is a label in it's a way. A label. My management company is very deliberately small. Deliberately small, I'm very, very hands-on, and I'm not interested in dealing in a huge sphere of music. It's styles. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's not the way I do. So you get the, some of the bigger management companies where, you know, they, there's, you know, there's a pop wing, there's a metal wing, there's a, <laughs> you know, there's an alternative wing, you know, there's a country wing, they've got offices in Nashville, blah, blah, blah. For me, Sports it's, wing. Just, yeah, it's absolutely. You know, for me, it's always been about a small, concentrated focus of artists. Um, makes it a lot easier. Yeah, and what, so off topic slightly from that, because it makes sense. I mean, you basically, like a label, like the idealized version of a label, you've created a community amongst your artists and your artists where you can protect them and guard them and not overextend to the point where saying no or otherwise, it, the power is in the fact that you have an identity and you stand for something. And that's Here, valuable. Here's I mean, the I, analogy it's amazing. That, that we use in our business, and it's probably applicable in yours. But I always, I, I, I talk about how having a, uh, a, an artist's legacy is, is kind of like walking up a down escalator. So if you're standing still, you're not standing still. You're moving backwards. And if you're scrambling so fast to overcome the downward trajectory of the escalator, you trip all over yourself, you can ruin the whole trip. So you have to find that sweet spot that's not doing nothing and not doing too much. Mm -hmm. right? And oversaturation is a big problem, as, as Jonathan talked about. Yeah. Well, so uh, again, so I have one specific question more to get your input on, especially from the managerial side. You know, you recently saw, I'm sure, that Taylor Swift uh, pulled her catalog. But I'm curious, because what you were just kind of talking through is, I mean, obviously, as a listener with, with music shifting into streaming, omnipresence of, of the tunes, the, you know, the, the ubiquitousness of it, or it's surrounding you, it, constant availability, what is your, I mean, you don't have to go on record if you don't feel comfortable doing so, but like, what, what is that, like, what is, if you, if you put your manager hat on for one of your acts and, that, and you were faced with that type of decision, what do you think of that? <laughs> one minute 30. I mean... I know, I know, yeah, I, I know, know that's, that's what I was thinking. We could go, we could go. Uh, to, I know that's a big question, but you know what so, I mean? It's so, uh, personally, I think streaming, streaming's the future, whether people like it or not. Um, I don't believe one size necessarily fits all with streaming. I think Spotify have been, for whatever reason, Spotify have always been pictured as the bad guys in this. I'm not talking about good and bad guys, but the biggest music streamer out there is YouTube. Right. Without doubt. You know, Spotify, I think, currently has 41 million active users and 13.5 million of them are paying. My issue with Spotify, if they made it easier for themselves, and this is an opinion, and everyone has an opinion on streaming, of course. 
is that you have an ad supported you have an ad supported tier, which is free to everybody. Okay, so every three songs they pay you an ad, and you have a premium tier. The premium tier, to me, are real active record buyers. They're paying their nine dollars ninety nine a month, their nine euros ninety nine, or their nine pounds ninety nine, whatever they're paying a month. Um, my feeling would be is that to get around the situation with something like even a Taylor Swift, and you'd have to ask them, would be that maybe, and Spotify won't do it, is, is there a window? Is there a window between making something available on the premium service earlier than it's made available on a free service? Right. Because I think that the key is, in order for Spotify to work, it's all, about, it's, well, it's all about scale. Spotify will work if they get enough payers. Or YouTube will work if it gets enough. You know, obviously YouTube have now done this music key, which is a, their version of a subscription situation. But what's interesting is people take things down off... off it's, it's slightly weird that people take things down off, off Spotify, yet if I, make a, if I make a search now... So if you go on Taylor Swift and you look on any of the... I think RDO have it on a premium service, but I think if you go on Deezer, if you go on Spotify, you can't find Taylor Swift's music or a catalogue. If I make a search on YouTube... I can, I can go on and I will see, probably within the space of, give me 30 seconds, I can have the whole Taylor Swift album there streamed. Um, some of it's ad-supported, so there is revenue, and some of it's not. There's, I saw something that was like 400,000 views of unsupported value. Right. So on one hand, the labels are trumpet, trumpeting you know, YouTube as a, as a marketing tool, and, on, and, and 10 million views, 10 million views is, a, is a marketing stroke of genius. On another hand, they're looking at 10 million streams on Spotify and going like, that's X amount of lost sales. Yeah, not enough money. So I think there's a lopsided effect. I think the discovery process needs to be better. The curation process needs to be better on streaming. For an artist that needs discovery, like uh, some of my artists, like King Crawl, like, I don't know, uh, Perfume Genius, sure. someone where there's, all, you know, or War on Drugs, anyone who's got a real good album but it's very niche, I think streaming's great for them. Taylor Swift probably looks at it and thinks, I'm, I, there is an element of cannibalization. I am a brand, people know I am, and I want to protect the record sales. Right. So I think that's, that's, that's yeah, long and short. That was really bad moderating by me. Sorry. Throwing that question at the end, I'm sorry. <laughs> but okay. uh, we are over time now. I wish we could continue on. I'm sorry that we uh, didn't get your take there. But Whatever he said. Right, I, theoretically, yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Very and, uh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.